Acid rain is a topic that's in our news and in our lives a lot these days, and students don't often understand exactly what acid rain is all about. They've heard the term, but they really don't understand. So when we're talking about acid rain and talking about acids and bases, I do a small-scale acid rain lab that allows the students to try to relate to what's going on with that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to set the experiment up, and we're going to see what happens with that. I have a Petri dish, and into the Petri dish we're going to place a variety of samples of materials to simulate materials that we might have in the environment. So for example, we're going to take a small piece of apple, and I want a small piece of the apple skin so that we can see that nice red color. And then we're also going to take a piece of the apple flesh so that we can see that nice white part that we enjoy eating. We're going to place those around the perimeter of the plate. In addition, We'll take and put a small amount of calcium carbonate. There are a lot of limestone type materials and calcium carbonate will simulate some building materials and some environmental kinds of conditions that we might have. So we'll place a small amount of calcium carbonate in there as well. We're going to take a small piece of a red flower and we'll place the flower in there to represent living matter that we might have around. I'm using a carnation today. I found that red colors work quite well with this process, like a rose or any other type of petal works fairly well as, as, as well. Then we're going to take and put a piece of magnesium metal that we've polished so that it's nice and shiny and has a nice reactive surface in there. And we'll place that in there to represent metals that might be in our environment that we would work with. Then we'll put a couple of indicators. I'm going to use a small amount of bromothymol blue. The bromothymol blue, of course, is a blue in the base, and it will become a reddish yellow color, or actually yellow in the acid. And we want to be careful not to get the liquids too far around so that they make a mess. And we'll also put our favorite universal indicator solution in there. Students by this point would have done a number of labs with universal indicator so that they would understand that the green is the neutral color, that the red-orange would be the acidic color, and that the blue-purple would be the base area. So we'll place just a couple of drops of that in there as well. And we want to be careful that we don't let those liquids run around in there too much. To create the acid rain, we're going to take a small weighing boat and place the weighing boat into the center. And I've already made a little bit of a mess there, but we'll see if we can't continue. And with the weighing boat, what we're going to do is to place about 10 drops of a dilute sodium sulfite solution in there. About 10 drops. I also want to take some distilled water and I want to dampen some of the samples that I have inside of there. So we're going to put a little bit of distilled water on the calcium carbonate because remember, acid rain works with uh, liquid materials. We're going to put a little bit of liquid on the flower petal as well. We'll make sure that the apple skin is damp. We will not dampen the piece of magnesium because we know that magnesium is water reactive and so we don't want to influence that. So we've got apple skin, apple flesh, we have calcium carbonate that's been dampened, a piece of flower petal that is dampened, a piece of magnesium metal, some universal indicator, and some bromothymol blue. To kick off off the acid rain reaction, we're going to place some sulfuric acid in here, and then we'll quickly put the lid on top. We should begin to see some color changes with the indicators within the first few seconds, so we'll want to watch carefully for that. So we'll put about five drops of the sulfuric acid solution in. And then we'll put the top on to capture the change. We can probably begin to see a little bit of color change that's taking place with the universal indicator. It's gone from its normal green color to more of a red color we'll begin to see a little bit of change in the bromothymol blue solution as this process takes place as well. And so while we wait for a couple of those changes to occur, let me talk a little bit about how I would set this up in my classroom. At the beginning of the period, students would come in, they would go into the lab station, and they would set this material up, 
And obviously it takes just a few moments for the students to do the actual mechanics of getting all of this in place. They would write down observations about what those materials look like to begin with, and then they would come back into the classroom area. I have the advantage of having a combo lab classroom. They would come back into the classroom area, and then we would discuss what is acid rain? How is it produced? What effects would we expect for, to see on, on materials? And of course, there are pictures and textbooks that show the gargoyles on statues or on churches, and how the, over the years the acid rain has corroded the features of that. Or they might show a limestone building where that there would be uh, etched or something of that type. Then after we've had a chance to look at some chemical reactions on the board, talk about the process that's going on, we would go back into the lab area for about the last 10 minutes of class, and this setup would have run for maybe, oh, 20 minutes or so while we were carrying on a class discussion. When we went back into the lab area, then the students could then begin to make some observations. Now, they will see some changes within that 20 minutes of time, and they can often see that there are some changes that have taken place, obviously, with the indicators. They will sometimes see a little bit of change that takes place with the flower, and they will sometimes see some changes that take place with the apple. The magnesium sometimes does not. What I want to do now is I want to swap this out of the way, and then I'm going to place a sample in here that's been set up for probably about three or four hours now so that we can see what the effects of a long-term process would be. Have you got a good shot of that? What we see in this situation now is that our apple skin is no longer red. It has gone to kind of a bleached out whitish yellow color. We see that the apple flesh still looks nice and white. There is a little bit of change in the calcium carbonate. Uh, the students sometimes say it looks a little crusty. The red flower petal no longer is red. It's completely washed out. The magnesium metal uh, if you look very closely, you may be able to see that it's slightly pitted on the surface and that there may be a little darkening of that. That's difficult to see. Of course, the bromothymol blue solution has changed to the yellow form, and our universal indicator solution has also changed into the red form with that process. So the students will see a fairly dramatic change within a class period, but if you save one from an earlier period, or if you save one from one day and then let the students come back and see the results the next day, we can see a definite amount of change. A, a concept that is needed to discuss with this, is this point is that the acid environment that we're creating in here is not the same as what we would find in our atmosphere. We have created multifold, huge concentration of acidity in this reaction plate, and it is not equal to the concentration of acidity in the air. And you want to make sure that you clarify that with students, because they're going to think that when acid rain is created from industrial or environmental processes, that it's as concentrated as what we see here, and it is not. However, neither do I have 15, 20, or 200 years to see what the effect of that acid rain will be. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to speed up in a time-lapse kind of process that we've got a highly concentrated acid rain environment here to see what will happen in a class period versus trying to let this thing set up and run over a period of many years. Whether that's equal or not, I don't know if it's fair, but at least it's a concept that you need to explain to the students that this is not what's happening in our environment, not at least at these concentration levels. But this is a way that the students can look at that. Now, there's one last thing that I want to look at at this point, and that is to take a look at our apple. When we start off with the apple, this apple was cut earlier, and we notice the typical darkening that we would see on the surface of the apple. It's not very appetizing. But if we take a look at the apple that is in our dish here, we see that that apple is still nice, pretty, and it has not oxidized. So one of the advantages of using some of the materials like this is that the sulfiding agents that are in here are often used as antioxidizing materials. You might actually take and dip your apples or your bananas that you're going to set out on a fruit tray into a dilute uh, citric acid solution or into a dilute lemon solution or perhaps into ascorbic acid, all of which are found in some commercial products. And it keeps the surfaces of those foods from turning. At one point, lettuce and other types of produce were washed in a sulfiding material, which is similar to the sodium sulfite that we've created in here, and that was to prevent the lettuce from turning brown after it had been out on the salad bar for a period of time. 
They don't do that as much anymore because we found that some people have reactions to the sulfites and it causes reactions with asthma and other types of things. But we do see that it is very effective in preventing that oxidizing process from going on and that there are benefits to that as well as perhaps some detriments. So this is the small scale acid rain lab, a quick and easy way to show some of the effects that acid rain might have on some common environmental materials.